Number three, like I said, it's a very short charge, so I'm just going to be hitting it. Romans chapter 1 verse 4. Now, resurrection made holiness possible. Resurrection made holiness what? Possible. Now, Romans 1 4 said, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the what? Dead. You see, there is something called the spirit of holiness. And when we're talking about holiness here, holiness is not about, it's not tying your hair and covering your ear and not wearing earring. Those are outward shoe, okay? But when we're talking about holiness, holiness actually means something that has been sanctified, set apart for God. And you see, that's one of the things why somebody is, that is holy cannot do what he wants to do with himself because he has been separated. Are you with me? The reason why we can live separated lives is because of the resurrection. From what? From the dead. So holiness becomes a possibility. Are you with me? Come on, are you with me? The spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You see, before resurrection, men could not really live for God. <laughs> Are you with me? Men couldn't live for God. But resurrection from the dead made it possible. Every one of us now can live a consecrated life. Every one of us can live a dedicated life. No wonder the Bible says that sin shall not have dominion over us. And the only thing that made this possible is because of what? Resurrection. Number four, as I try to round up, like I said, is it just a very short charge You see, without resurrection, there will be no hope. Life will be hopeless. Life will be meaningless. And I'm going to look at this hope in two dimensions, both the normal hope, as in being hopeful, and then the hope of resurrection. And probably that's where I'm going, to, I'm going to be saying three points together. Lively hope. First Peter chapter 1 verse 3. First Peter chapter 1 verse 3. You see, life will be miserable without hope. <laughs> Are you with me? The only thing that makes life worth living, the only thing that makes people to want to keep Striving, keep trying is because of hope. Are you with me? In fact, most times when you see people take their life is because they have come to that place where they begin to feel very hopeless. But let me tell you this. There is something that the death of Jesus Christ brought to us. It is what they call lively hope. Now, 1 Peter 1 verse 3, the Bible says... Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy had begotten us unto what? A lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus from what? The dead. He has begotten us to what? A lively hope. And you see, the empty grave, so far as man is concerned, the, the worst thing that can happen to people is death. Is it not? That's so far as man is concerned. But you see, Jesus defeated death. 
just to help us to understand that there is nothing, there is no hopeless situation. Jesus defeated death just to let you know that there is no hopelessness in God. The reality is this. I don't know what you are going through, but the grave, the empty grave is a pointer that there is nothing that God cannot do. That empty grave is there to show us that your life is not hopeless. He begot us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now let me connect this to one or two more things and I bring it to close. Now let me tell you this. One of the things that brings hope is for you to really understand that that true life is in Christ Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus speaking in John 14, where we read, he said, because I live, you will live also. Because I live, you will live also. Now, let me tell you this. One of the things that happens to anyone, any child of God, is that the fear of death is taken away. <laughs> you may not... Do you, uh, okay. As much as death is a painful thing, but you see, for a child of God, a child of God doesn't really die, he sleeps. Hey, hey, are you with me? No, you see, it's good for us to remind ourselves these things. In fact, that's one of the things that, one of the reasons that the Bible will say that we should not mourn like the people who are in the world when we lose it. It's very painful, as painful as it is. You see, God, there is hope in Christ Jesus. There is a lively hope. And the thing that made this lively hope possible is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now, let me tell you this. Anyone who died in Christ is not dead, is, is asleep. And it means that we can see the person again in the resurrection morning. And as I conclude, I want you to know also that the thing that resurrection made possible is our resurrection from the dead. <laughs> Now, see, I want you to understand something. I hope you know that Jesus is not the first person that died and came back to life. Hey, are you with me? I'm, I'm about to close now. Are you with me? Hey, are you with me? Jesus wasn't the first person that died and came back to life. In the Old Testament, there were prophets that rose people back to life. Is it not? In fact, the bone of Elisha brought somebody back to life. The Bible says that Elijah, Elisha was sick, wearing of the sickness, he died. And he was buried. And one of those days, the, the, the army of Israel, they were, they, were, they, were, they were trying to bury somebody and there was war. War broke out. And they quickly, in a haste, threw somebody <laughs> to the grave of Elisha. And the person's dead body made contact with the bone of Elisha and the person jacked back to life. Now Jesus came and rose. I don't even know what to make of that thing. But you see, since we don't have time, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dwell on that. <laughs> but you know what they call Jesus? That Jesus is the first begotten from the dead. Now, the reason why he's called the first begotten from the dead, two reasons. Not because he was the first person that died and came back to life. Jesus himself rose, at least made how many people alive on record. You have Lazarus. You have the widow. You have the daughter, Jairus' daughter. There were, there were like many people like that that Jesus brought, brought back to life. But you see, Jesus was First of all, the first person that came back to life by himself.
every other person that rose from the dead needed the aid of somebody else. The anointed. But Jesus didn't need the aid of anybody. You know what he said? He said, by my own self, I lay down my life. And by, I also have power to take it up. Now, the most important thing that made him the first begotten from the dead, he's actually the first person that, that rose, that came back to life as in regeneration. I hope you know that the reason why Jesus was able to die was because, first of all, the reason why he was able to die physically was because he died spiritually. <laughs> hey, are you with me? The reason why Jesus was able to die physically was because he died spiritually first. And how did he die spiritually? The Bible says, he that knew no sin, not only did he sin, he now became sin. And by becoming sin, the Bible says, and God, whose eyes is of a purer eye that he cannot behold iniquity, did, you know, turned his back was separated from Jesus because actually, real death is separation from God. Real death is not that a man died. You know, that's why Jesus will say, don't fear the people who have only the power to kill and they don't have, the only person I, I recommend that you fear is the one who has power to kill your flesh and still carry your soul and put it in hell. He said, that is the only one to fear. Hell yeah. Beloved, real death is actually separation from God. That's the true meaning of death. So Jesus was separated from death, from God, then he was able to die. Now let me tell you this. Let me say this just in person. You see, that was actually the thing that Jesus, you know, when Jesus was, was crying, if it were your will, let this cup pass over me. Now, it wasn't about the, the nails. It wasn't about the, the tongues. It wasn't about all the torture that he went through. No. The thing was that for the very first time in his life, one, he was going to be made sin. Do you, do you understand what that means? And then, secondly, his father was going to be separated from him. And it was when that happened that he freely gave up the ghost. And then on the third day, they, they, they sealed the tomb, wrapped him up. And soldiers surrounded the whole place. And then on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead, folded the napkins. He wasn't even in a hurry to escape, escape from the grave. Have you ever been trapped before? Come on, have you been trapped before? Hey, you're not answering. Have you ever been trapped before? And immediately, the place opened. You took off. But Jesus was not trapped. You see, he, he stayed and folded the napkins and arranged the place very well. He wasn't in a hurry. You know, it was the same thing that happened to Paul and Silas. The Bible says they sang and the, the prison shook and the gates opened and they were not in a hurry to run away. Now, there were two things. One, because they were genuinely believers. Number two, they know the key. It wasn't, it wasn't an accident. Are you, are you with me? It wasn't a coincidence. It, was, it wasn't a coincidence. It was something that they have the key. They know how to unlock. They can, if you lock it, they can still unlock it again. And they were inside that place. The jailer came and thought that Paul and, and Silas, they've, they've all run away with the prisoners. And you know, guys, can you see the anointing that these people have? Even they made the prisoners not to run away. They were not the only prisoners. Come on. How many of you knew when in the East they were doing unknown gunmen? Unknown, unknown gunmen. They broke several prisons. 
And once they break any prison, bah, all the inmates will take off. But in this case, on a known gunman came into the prison. <laughs> a known gunman came into the prison, opened the prison, and yet the people sat. And when the jailer came in and wanted to kill himself, Peter said, no, do yourself. Paul said, do yourself no harm. We are all what? We are all here. We are all here. We are all here. We are all here. Hey. We are all here. That is just, by the way, I won't, I won't press that, but I want you to know 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 13, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a guarantee that anyone who dies in Christ will live again. You know, there was this time, there is this, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, there was this debate, and they were debating that there is no resurrection. And Paul began to write and said, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. So that means it is the resurrection of Jesus that is going to make the resurrection of the dead. Very possible. Now the question is this. Do you have this Christ in your life? Number two. Are you living for him? Or you're living for yourself? Are you living for him? Or you're living for yourself? It is the death of Jesus that makes resurrection. We don't die. <laughs> do, you, do you remember something that when Lazarus died and they came and told Jesus, Lazarus, the one you is sick, and then and later Jesus delayed two days and then the journey took extra two days and as they were going, Jesus began to speak to them and said, Lazarus is sleeping. He said, let's go and wake him. And the disciples were wondering, if Lazarus is asleep, when we sleep, do you come to wake us? Why do we have to travel two days to wake him? Now, let me tell you this. There are spiritual language or there is a spiritual language and there is a human language. Now, the Bible says that Jesus had to speak in a way they will understand. He said, okay, let me just tell you, Lazarus is dead. I'm glad I wasn't there when he died, but we're going there to wake him up. And Jesus said, told Mary and Martha, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, whosoever, lead, whosoever believes in me, though he were dead, shall he do what? Live again. And Apostle Paul capped it this way. He said, if only in this world that we have hope, we are amongst all men most miserable. If all that we are living is just for this life, the Bible says that we are amongst men most miserable. Now the question is this, what are you living for? What are you living for? Are you still living for yourself? Are you still living for things? If only in this life you have hope, there is a living hope that the death of Jesus Christ made available. And I'm sure you know that if Jesus tarries in the next 70 years, I'm not really sure there's anybody that will be here. Apart from maybe those babies. Huh? I'm not sure. Is it? Huh? Hey, is there anybody that will be here in the next 80 years? I'm not sure. Me, I will not be here. And I don't even want to be here myself. <laughs> because one of the things I don't want to be is to be a liability. Eh? But we're going to die strong. Okay? There's a way the righteous dies. 
when he wants that you put yourself, put your house in order. That's the way I want to die, like Jacob. The Bible says he gathered himself and he gave up the ghost. That's the way to die. And it's not necessarily about the age. But you see, there's a way you walk with God. You're actually going to know when you're about to go. You can find that out in the life of Paul, in the life of Peter. Peter said, look, it, it, the time for me to put out this earthly tabernacle is near. You can walk with God that way and know when you're about to leave. Oh, and you see, for the righteous, when they are dying, they die with smile. <laughs> Apostle Paul said, I am ready to be poured out. In fact, he came to a point that he said, he said, to live is, to die is gain. To die is gain. <laughs> I know for some of you, to live is gain. But Paul said, to die is what? Gain. I think I've shared it to you through one experience I had. I saw, I experienced myself. I went to the hospital. A woman had a near-death experience. She was, and he is a believer because I, I want to believe she's still alive. And they kept praying and she came back to life. And I thought this woman was going to be excited that she came back to life. This woman was quarreling with her husband, quarreling with her pastor. Say, why did you bring me back? He said, do you, Kai, do you, do you know where you people brought me back from? No, this is not story. I was there when the woman was quarreling, was angry with the, everybody there, the people. The pastor was saying, we still need, he said, need me for what? He said, see your children, see your, for what do I, do you know where, ah! If only in this life we have hope, we are amongst men most miserable. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead means that we have a lively hope. Our hope is not just here. Our hope is in the life to come. Now let me end with this story. A woman had two sons. And one of the sons was very bad, terrible, did many terrible things. And the other one was born again, living well. And a time came that when this woman was about to die, she laid on her dying bed and brought those two sons and spoke with the one that was born again, the one that was, you know, and said, look, I'm going. And he said, goodbye. See you on the resurrection morning. And then he looked at the one who was not born again, terrible, spoke with him and said, look, I've done everything to introduce you to Jesus. And he said, good night. And that one looked at her and said, why did you tell my brother goodbye? See you on the resurrection morning. And you told me good night. He said, see, because I know where I'm going. And I know where he's going when he dies. We're going to meet. But you, I am not sure of where, if I'm going to see you again, if you continue with this life. So that's why I told you good night. I know the woman died. That was the message that converted the son. Can you bow your heads as we pray?
Can you just go ahead and just thank him? Thank him for for this new life. This life that he has given to us. This life that has been made available by his death, burial and resurrection. I think there are two things that we need to do and we're going to do today. It's going to be a heart of gratitude. Because actually the death that he died we were meant to die. So, but there was substitution. There was substitution. He took our place and we took his place. Can we go ahead and thank him? Go ahead and thank him. Go ahead and thank him. The things that his resurrection procured for us. Regenerated spirit. <laughs> the depraved mind has been renewed, has been made alive. Has been made alive. If not, many of us would have been in Asasi. Oh, you, you heard the moderator talking about what the mom told him this morning. I said, look, thank God for resurrection. You would have been a cold boy. Thank God for resurrection. Thank God for resurrection. Can you imagine the person you would, you would have been? Can you imagine the person you would have been? <laughs> there is nothing the depraved man cannot be. Hey! You know, there's this movie I watched, which was a true life story. Something that happened in Florida. As civilized as those people are, if you see the you see the nature, how depraved man is, how depraved man is. It doesn't matter the school any man goes to. Without Christ, the person is depraved. It doesn't matter the certificate. It doesn't matter the training that you give to a man or a woman. Can we just thank him? That's just, it's, you see, it should just be more of a, a time of gratitude. Because if you are not able to appreciate what he has done for us, we will not be able to lay hold on what he has procured for us. Can you appreciate him? Because of this life, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Because of this resurrection, we can live a holy life. We can live for him. We can truly live. The Bible says that one died. So that all who live will cease to live for themselves but to live for him that died and rose again for, him, for them. That's holiness. That's separation. Can you make a plea this morning? Lord, in response to what you did for me on the cross and your resurrection, I lay my life at your feet. Can you lay your life for him? Can you, can you lay aside every weight? Can you present your body a living sacrifice? Go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray. That's one of the easiest ways to procure all the things that resurrection made available. When we live a consecrated life. It's one of the easiest way. The cheapest way. To live. Or to, to have the things. That resurrection made available. Oh.